Between the wars, it really wasn't clear how big a gun you needed to take out a tank. And frankly, the five five-inch boys wasn't enough. Tanks were basically introduced to combat in World War I. Uh, the British built lots of tanks. Uh, the Germans built very few, but instead they built a bunch of anti-tank rifles. These were basically Mausers on steroids. They fired a huge cartridge that would easily penetrate the armor of these very early tanks, rattle around inside, and could do remarkable damage. When the tank made its appearance in the First World War, it was a fearsome weapon. So after World War I, naturally there was a lot of thought given to a manned portable and a tank weapon. The British approached it essentially the same way that the Germans did. They developed a very large caliber, a 55 caliber bolt action rifle that fed from a five round magazine. It was originally to be called the stanchion gun. The head of the design team was uh, Captain Boys, and he died just before the gun was in final development, and they named it the Boys and a tank rifle in his honor. The weapon was capable of sending a projectile downrange at almost 2,800 feet per second, and it was capable of penetrating about an inch of armor at 90 degrees at a 100 meter range. In this earlier era, tank armor tended to be much more modest in comparison to what tanks looked like in 1944 and 1945. You didn't see big hulking beasts like the King Tiger or the American M26 Pershing in the era during which the Boy Santa tank rifle was being developed because the weapons introduced in 1937, it really begins to phase out in 1943. But even before that, its role began to change. And the changing role of this weapon is one that led it toward being used for anti-materiel purposes. Soldier confidence uh, was low in the boys' anti-tank rifle, understandably so. And in 1942, the Walt Disney Corporation got involved in the propaganda fight uh, to try and buck the troops up about the effectiveness of the boys' rifle, and they actually did a little cartoon short called Stop That Tank. In order to have a weapon with some anti-tank capability, the Marine Corps purchased some boys' rifles from the English Corporation in Canada, which made on a contract by the British government. And some of the boys' anti-tank guns did see combat in the Pacific in the hands of our raiders. One very interesting story is when the Marines invaded Macon Island. During the Macon raid, something very interesting happens with two particular Boyce anti-tank rifles. They had come ashore with the Marine Raiders. They were positioned along a wharf. The Japanese responded after the garrison on Macon didn't report in at dawn on August 18, 1942. They responded by sending a, a large seaplane down, an H-8K Emily, this very large, magnificent flying boat. And the aircraft landed in the lagoon, and as it taxied toward the island to investigate what had happened to this garrison overnight, the aircraft was brought under fire by 1919 machine guns and then two Marines armed with the boys' anti-tank rifle. And in the ensuing barrage of fire, the aircraft was destroyed. The wreckage of that aircraft remained there in early 1944 when U.S. Army soldiers landed on the island during Operation Flintlock. And it was depicted in one of the more famous images of the Pacific War. And the wreckage of this aircraft still sits there to this day at Macon disabled by accurate fire from two Marines armed with the boys' anti-tank rifle. Of course, a boys' rifle in 5.5 is considered a destructive device. That's why most of them that you see in civilian hands are actually in 50 BMG. That's all the time that we have for this week. If you like this show and you're not an NRA member, you need to sign up right now. Go to AmericanRifleman.org. I'm Mark Keefe, and I'll see you next week right here on American Rifleman Television.